pleasure to be here. Um, if I get the microphone on, there we go. So I hope that my, the picture and my title poses a question for you. I promise I'll answer those two questions by the end of the talk. I want to start by observing the dramatic transformation that humans are going through right now. We used to live like this in North America, or like this in Scandinavia, in mobile groups pursuing food. But because of technological advance, we can now collect in dense cities that, that look like this, New York City, my, my home. This process of urbanizing is something that a colleague of mine calls the urbanization project. It's something that humans started in the Neolithic Revolution about uh, 10,000 BC. So we've spent 10,000 years urbanizing humans and we're only part way through that project, but it's a project that has an end that we can foresee by the end of this century. And one of the important questions is whether we move into cities that look like this or cities that look like this, and what is it that will make the difference between these two? Now, even in cities that we think of as being having slum conditions, very uh, unsafe conditions in terms of health, perhaps crime, people still find them very attractive. And it's important before we get going to just pause and ask why that is. What is it about urbanization, about density, that's so compelling? Let me give you one simple example. Imagine you had a thousand cities, each with 10,000 people in them. So small size cities. And imagine that we then group them all into a single city of 10 million people. What difference would that make? Well, here's one simple fact. It would take about 60% less copper to wire up everybody in the 10 million person city with electricity in their homes compared to uh, wiring up everybody in the different small cities. This is just one physical illustration of a very general point. Almost everything humans do is more efficient, more productive, more satisfying in a dense urban center. Now, let me give you another illustration of the importance of the size of cities. This picture illustrates the trajectories of airplanes as they fly over the United States at, at the night. It's presented at night so you can see the trajectories. Let me focus on the area in the circle, which is Denver, where I grew up. There's a big advantage right now to living in Denver rather than moving uh, 100, 200 miles to the east in the plains of Nebraska. Because in Denver, you can get on a plane, quickly get to the other big cities in the United States, and then get to the big cities around the world. So big cities are attractive, productive, places that people want to go, because things like electrification, access to goods and services is less expensive there. And cities are the hubs that now connect us to other hubs around the world. The person who ran a software consulting firm called MySQL, which supported an open source database, was once asked where his employees lived. And he said, they live all over the globe, but I guarantee you every one of them lives within an hour of a hub airport. This is the fact about large cities and high technology, knowledge intensive industries of our world. Now, to appreciate the importance of scale, this is a picture of Denver and a picture of the Denver airport. Let's zoom in on that airport. That airport is 115 square kilometers. It's the largest airport in the United States. If you look at the pattern of the runways, it can sustain multiple landings at the same time, even during stormy conditions. For reasons I'll explain later in the talk, this airport is certain to become a critical hub 
in international trade. But it's possible partly because the airport is so large and there's an airport there because Denver is a large and rapidly growing city. Now, let's turn to the, the challenge that we face uh, in addressing the opportunities of, of urbanization. Right now, the world's population is about 6.9 billion, or at least in last year it was 6.9 billion. We, we know that about half of the world's population lives in an urban center. This has gotten some attention, but that's not the interesting fact. Here's the interesting fact. By the end of this century, world population will hit its maximum of 10 billion people. It will never get bigger than that. And if the urbanization rate worldwide turns out to be like it is in Latin America or North America, 70% of those 10 billion people will live in cities, so 7 billion, maybe even 80%, so 8 billion people. So we've taken a long time to get 3.5 billion people in cities, and in this century, will do more urbanization than in all of history to date. So what this means is urbanization is going to be much, much faster in this century. We'll do more urbanization than in one century than in the last 12,000 years. The other point is that the cities we build in this century will last forever. If you look again at the plains in the United States, no big city is going to emerge in eastern Nebraska or Kansas inside that circle. If there's any growth in population in the United States, any growth in the cities, it's going to come to Denver because of its inherent advantages of already being a big city. This is the pattern of cities the United States is likely to have forever because cities don't go away once you build them. There are many parts of the world that have yet to develop their full system of cities, but in the same way, once they're built, we'll live with those forever. Some parts of the world will end up being close to the hub. Other parts will end up being in the periphery, like Nebraska. Now, this sounds like an enormous challenge to do this urbanization, to do it well. But as always, a challenge is an opportunity. And to explain that opportunity, I need to step back just a bit and think about the sources of progress that humans enjoy. Progress depends on two forces. One are new technologies. This is obvious. We all see the benefits from new technologies. But the second are rules that govern how we interact with each other. Rules of common courtesy, rules of the road, rules of order. Rules are essential for us to get the benefits from interacting with many other people. Now, we often point out that technologies have this feature that we can share them. If someone makes a discovery of a powerful technology, they can share that technology by producing a good that's based on that design, producing software that captures it, producing a pharmaceutical that captures the formula, and then everyone can benefit from it. The way we often motivate or illustrate that benefit of sharing technologies is by saying that if you give someone a fish, you feed them for a day, but if you teach someone to fish, you destroy another aquatic ecosystem. Now, this is not the way you usually tell this story, this little saying, but it's the way we should, because it's actually what humans have done over and over again, and it's an illustration of the importance of rules. New technologies like nets, hooks, trawler ships, long line trawler ships, are potentially good, but if we don't have rules that limit the catch of these new technologies, will deplete a fishery and do enormous harm. So it takes both new technologies and new rules for true progress. Now, what else do we know about rules? How can rules harm us? 
One of the greatest tragedies in the world right now is that bad rules prevent existing technologies from being shared with everyone who could benefit from them. This is a picture of some students in Africa doing their homework under street lights near the airport because they don't have electricity at home. So how can it be that a technology like electric light, which is more than a century old, which can provide light at very low cost, and especially in a city where people are close, at very low cost in terms of the amount of copper to wire everyone up, how can it be that there are still people who don't have electricity at home? It's because there are rules in this country and many countries which impede the processes that can lead to transfers of technologies, inflows of technologies. So we want to think of rules as being important at the frontier when we invent a new technology, like trawler ships. But rules can also be very important impediments. The wrong rules can be impediments to catching up when they keep valuable technologies from spreading around the world. If you ask why slums are unpleasant places to live, in part, it may be because people are poor, but there's no shame in being poor. There's no shame in living in a house with a tin roof. The problem in slums is that the people who live in slums are typically denied the protection of any system of rules. There's no legal right to their land. There's no law enforcement of basic rules about preventing crime, preventing pollution, preventing trash. So the, the reason why some urban development is less productive, less useful, less attractive, less encouraging of human progress is because cities develop without rules. With the right rules, cities can develop in a way that truly unleashes our potential. So why is it that we end up with bad rules? Well, rules can take the form of, of laws. Those are obvious. But rules can also take the form of our norms about right and wrong. And our norms about right and wrong are more important on a day-to-day -day basis in determining how we interact with each other than the laws. And our norms can prevent us from passing the right laws as well. Let me give you a, a somewhat humorous illustration of the importance of norms in adjusting behavior. This is a sign that you can see in France. It's always fun to make friend of the French, by the way. Here's a more familiar sign in words that says that you're not supposed to urinate in public there. Uh, here's an, an older sign um, down in the lower right. Here's one which is, which is older still. Now, in a society like France that's as developed as France, why do they need signs like this? There's something about the norms in France that somehow does not encourage everyone to think of urinating in public as being bad. So they have signs, they have police that try and go out and give tickets to people for this. But in many other societies, the reason this strikes many of us as humorous is you'd never think of having to have a sign to tell you this or a policeman to give you a ticket for this because it's just the wrong thing to do. So in most places, the norms are that you don't do this, but norms are different in different places. Now, the point about norms is that they're very hard to change. These signs go back a long time in France. And it's much easier to change norms in a startup. So if you think about the norms inside a corporate culture, like in a, in, a, in a retailing firm like Dayton Hudson, when Dayton Hudson wanted to invent a whole different way of doing retailing, discount retailing, they created a startup, sent it off to a new location, kept it separate from the main organization, and said, go see if you can figure out this new model of discount retailing. And as you may know, Target was a huge success in the United States. Dayton Hudson was the only existing retailing firm as of the 1960s which made the transition to discount retailing. And they did it by starting a startup. 
Let me describe another, uh, another startup. Um, the, the King of England gave Pennsylvania to William Penn and said, this is your dominion. You can write a charter that specifies what you want to be true in, in, uh, in your dominion. The king knew full well that William Penn was a Quaker dissident who didn't adhere to the orthodoxy of uh, the Church of England. So Penn wrote a charter for Pennsylvania saying that in this new area, there would be a guaranteed right of freedom of religion. Now, achieving freedom of religion in England had been impossible for the king and for kings before him and kings coming after. The norms in England said it was wrong to allow people to worship in different churches. But William Penn was able to start a startup with a new norm that supported uh, freedom of religion, with laws that supported freedom of religion. It ultimately changed North America and changed the world. Or think about Shenzhen as a new special economic zone in China where the new rules there were that it was okay for a Chinese worker to be employed by those running dog capitalists that the government had been uh, talking about for so many decades. Shenzhen was the place where foreign firms could bring in technology, many of them Taiwanese firms, for example, that make things like the, the iPad now and the iPhone. Once the acceptance of the market model uh, or the power of the market model was demonstrated in Shenzhen, it could spread throughout China, but the success in the startup was critical when there was a backlash of the conservatives in China who wanted to stop the market process. That a core that could pioneer an entirely new model and a whole new way of organizing economic and social life, a successful core paved the way for reform throughout the rest of China. So what's the opportunity we have now? We have the opportunity with billions of people who want to move to cities to create new cities like Philadelphia, new cities like Shenzhen, which could set entirely new norms, norms that are more supportive of progress and through their success bring the rest of the world along with them. Now, why startups? The basic fact about norms is what I think is right and wrong is influenced by the people I'm around. If everybody around me thinks something is the right thing to do, I will naturally start to think that that's the right thing to do as well. When I moved to New York, but before I moved to New York from California, I thought it was wrong to jaywalk, to cross the street when the sign said don't cross. When I moved to New York, I learned it was right to jaywalk. For a while in New York, I would look at people and think they shouldn't do that. That's what they'll tell you in, in Zurich, in Switzerland, if you go and try and jaywalk there. In, in Zurich, the norm is that you don't jaywalk. In New York City, Everyone jaywalks. And within a few months of living there, suddenly I didn't get unhappy with people who jaywalked anymore. It just seemed like the right thing to do. So our norms are determined by the people around us, but then that makes it very hard for us to make a coordinated change in our norms. Now what you can use in a startup is selection. You can select in some people who believe in what you believe in and then you can reinforce amongst each other this new norm about the right way to do things. The new way to de develop software at Microsoft. The new way to develop consumer products at, at Apple. The new way to do retailing at Walmart or at, or at Target. The new belief about freedom of religion in Pennsylvania. William Penn recruited religious dissidents from all over the world to come to Pennsylvania because he promised in the law freedom of religion as soon as they came there, they then supported each other and freedom of religion was durable. It, it survived in Pennsylvania. An interesting counterexample to that was Maryland in the United States in the colonies, which also it had an earlier guarantee of freedom of religion, but it was started by a small Catholic elite 
and then it recruited as workers very large numbers of Protestants who, as soon as there was trouble uh, in England so the king couldn't protect the elite in Maryland, the Protestants overthrew the Catholic elite, reinstituted the, the Church of England, and started persecuting the Catholics and the Quakers. So change involves changing, in, changing norms. Changing norms involves selecting people who believe in the new norms first. They reinforce those norms with each other. And then gradually, as more people join them, they also take on the new norms. So the process, you can imagine, is rules that influence who comes, say to Pennsylvania. Who comes determines the norms, and then the norms determine the rules. And you have a, a closed cycle, which is hard to change once it's up and running. And it can go in different ways. In, uh, if your rules in a new area support something like special concessions, special privileges that some firms get, what those concessions will attract are cronies, crony capitalism, and the norms that this new place will develop will be the norms of exploitation and stasis. Don't change anything. This is one of the problems in some special zones, free zones, is that they get stuck in this cycle, and then they become a force for ill in the entire country. But what's the other alternative? Suppose that what you have are rules of competition, and you attract people who are achievers, and they bring with them and develop the norms of inclusion. Everybody can com compete and progress. Then you can have a zone which is more successful and becomes the core that supports reform in the entire country or society. So now, how fast can we build new cities? Um, if you look at Shenzhen, next to Hong Kong, the most successful of the first special economic zones in China, this is a picture you can look up in Google Map from uh, 1990. Uh, the key thing to note is all the green space on this, along this 45 kilometer line. 10 years later, this is what you saw in, in Shenzhen. Millions of people moved into Shenzhen within 10 years. And Shenzhen, which was just a fishing village in the beginning, now has a, a skyline that looks like this. So new cities can grow very rapidly under the right conditions. Can we afford new cities? Well, look at what the land in New York is worth. Not the buildings, just the raw land. A, a square meter of land in New York, in Manhattan, can be worth 2,000, 10,000, 15,000. In some cases, more than $100,000 per square meter. So if you took raw land and converted it from being worthless into being worth hundreds or thousands of dollars per square meter, that gain in value more than, would be more than enough to finance the investments you need to make this an attractive city to have people to come to. In the simplest possible terms, building new cities can be a very profitable real estate development uh, project. It doesn't take charity, it doesn't take aid, it takes the right rules. Now how would investors be protected to build new cities? Uh, they could be protected in many ways like they were protected in Hong Kong, which you can think of as a special zone which was built in China but using rules of the British uh, common law and British administrative systems. Now, what kind of structure could we build that's like that today? structure that I've suggested is this notion of a charter city. The charter is, is borrowed from William Penn's notion of a charter guaranteeing rights to people, a constitution. And a charter city requires an unoccupied site, a charter that is inclusive in the sense that it provides equal treatment under the law for everyone who comes and lives there, and a choice about entry and exit. No one has to come there no one has to uh, stay. But this charter could be a charter which specifies very different rules than the ones that existed before. And as a startup, it can attract the people who believe in those rules and make them self-sustaining. What does it take to do this in practice? There's three kinds of roles for countries. Some country has to be the host, 
China was the host for Hong Kong, but it, it came under force. The British took Hong Kong by force. That will never happen today. But some country could volunteer its land to be the host. Some country will be the source. People will come. And other countries could be partners to help support this. Now, which country might want to be a host right now? One country which has already said it wants to do this is Honduras, your neighbor. This is a picture of one site that they're considering where there's essentially very little economic value there at all. And if that could be turned into a site of about a billion square meters, and if each of those square meters could be worth 100, 1,000, $5,000 per square meter, you could afford to build a city there. Honduras has lots of land on its Caribbean coast where this could be done, and potentially even some on its uh, Atlantic coast. And uh, Honduras happens to be well situated, uh, just as Guatemala is, to participate in the global expansion of trade and goods through air travel rather than along ships. At this point, more than 40% of the value of world, world trade now goes on airplanes. Not by weight. By weight, it's tiny. But by value, it's 40%. It'll soon be the majority. And it just turns out, coincidentally, that the most important cargo airports in the world, Singapore, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Incheon, Alaska, are all on a great circle route that comes over the, uh, comes over the earth along that white arrow, passes over Denver that I pointed to before, and then will come through Central America as it continues to Latin America. It will be the backbone of trade in by air for the world in the coming, uh, in the coming century because of the rapid growth in Asia. Now, partners in Honduras, the discussions have already led to an agreement with one country which has said we will let our Supreme Court be the appeals court for the new courts that you will set up in this new zone. So the, the neutrality and objectivity and competence of these new courts can be assured by relying on the existence of a well-established court elsewhere in the world. Other discussions are underway about the possibilities of provision of services. Uh, for example, we know of cases where nonprofit or government agencies come in and provide uh, the custom services for a country. There are a few cases around the world where one country has actually agreed to provide the policing services for another country. The Solomon Islands asked Australia to put together a coalition which is now doing policing in, uh, in the Solomon Islands. So other, govern other governments that are skilled at key kinds of government services could be used as part, could act as partners to help this new zone uh, grow in, in Honduras. And where will the source countries be? Well, that was the picture in the beginning. This is a picture that illustrates a book called Enrique's Story, which is about someone who leaves Honduras, leaves Tegucigalpa, to go to the United States on the trains through Mexico. But he stands in place of the million people a year who would leave Latin America up until 2008 and go to the United States each year, roughly two-thirds of whom went illegally, without legal rights uh, to live there, often without their families uh, that they could take with them. Those people could go to a new city if it offered safety, if it offered residency rights for their families, if it offered the kinds of employment opportunities that people go to places like the United States to get. So finally, what are the takeaways for this conference, whose focus is more, somewhat more narrowly on special zones? First, bigger is better. There are enormous gains to scale and uh, gains associated with key pieces of infrastructure like an airport. So bigger zones will be successful, more zones that can cluster together, zones that will be around places that will be hubs will be more successful. So this is as true of special zones and free zones as it is of cities. Second, 
selection is decisive. Zones which attract the right kinds of people can then create norms and become a positive force for the rules in the zone, but the rules in the whole society. But zones that attract people for special con concessions, special advantages, special privileges, special because they get special access, those can actually become negative forces impeding reform in the rest of the country. And then finally, you should really think of what you're doing and what I'm proposing about charter cities as being all examples of creating reform zones. Zones that are fundamentally about reforming the rules that we use to structure our interaction with each other. So think of reform zones, not free zones. Thank you. I'm happy to take any, any questions that anyone might have. Uh, it, while, while we're waiting, why don't you, if you can just say your question, I'll repeat it. And then. Actually, th there's a mic coming, so I'll let you. Good, I'll repeat the, uh, the observation. Wait. Uh, basically, uh, you have already mentioned what are the benefits of these uh, charter cities. Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what are the major issues and drawbacks that you have encountered in implementing this idea? Mm -hmm. Because I heard that there was a coup d'etat uh, idea in some of the countries that you tried to implement this idea. And in particular in Honduras, how do you see the process moving on? Yeah. And another. Uh, reflection is in relation to the uh, weak property rights that could be uh, implemented in those cities, uh, which would permit the development of science and technology. Right, okay. So um, the, the first question is, what, what are the major roadblocks? I think the best way to describe that is to describe the sequence of steps that are required. So Honduras started by amending their constitution to create a structure that allows for two systems within the same country. So the judicial system in this zone can have a different appeals court than the judicial system in the rest of the country. So the first thing was a constitutional amendment. The second thing was a law which specified what kinds of governance structure, what kinds of courts, what kinds of arrangements would there be in the new zone. So those are the first steps. Then the next step is the participation of some partners who can provide assurance and credibility to the endeavor as the government goes out to induce, encourage large-scale foreign investment. So right now, the government, they've amended the Constitution, they've passed the law, they're right now in the process of appointing members of a kind of a board of trustees that they call the Transparency Commission of highly regarded, high integrity individuals from all over the world who can provide assurances to the firms that enter, but also to the Honduran citizens that what's being done in this zone is transparent and for the benefit of the entire society. The next step after those arrangements will be to attract large scale foreign investment, but here is where the gains from scale become uh, just enormous. There's never been in the history of humans on Earth a project that was developed at this scale. It is therefore extremely attractive to large investors from throughout the world who see that city building is going to be the most important economic activity of this century. And this is a place to go prototype the activities that they think they can go do throughout the world. So I am absolutely confident that large-scale uh, investment in infrastructure will uh, flow into this zone once the governance structure is in place. And the challenge is creating the conditions that can let a government take bold steps like amend the Constitution and pass the laws and agree in a consensus in society that we will try something new. This is different, but we'll try something new. Those are hard conditions to establish. 
they exist right now in Honduras, and so they're making rapid progress. The issue of the weak property rights. Yep. The, 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 main, the main point I keep emphasizing about a new city in, in Honduras is that many of the people who first go there will be like Enrique, and so they'll be working on garment assembly, light manufacturing, toys, maybe electronics assembly, that you could dream of a city which attracts all the, uh, like Boulder, Colorado, which attracts, I think it is more PhDs per capita than any other city in the United States. You could dream of, it, of, of building a city like that, but that's not what the market is. It's a little bit like when autos were first being produced. You could dream of making a handmade Bugatti race car and sell it to a few rich people, but the market was for the Model T. The billions of people who will get their first job when they move to a city. So the key in this city is to make it a place which is low cost to live in, low cost public transport, good education, low cost housing. So it's the opportunity, it's the first step for somebody who's getting his or her very first wage from a formal sector firm. And patent rights, well, you know, if the aim is to be like Hong Kong in the 1950s, it'll get to Hong Kong of the, of the 2000s, and you can worry about patent rights then. Excuse me, uh, Professor Romer. Uh, my name is Robert Chen. I would like to raise one question. Uh, not against your theory about bigger is better, but could you uh, compare some European experience? For example, uh, con consider about Sweden or the Netherlands, uh, they are developed a current innovative park. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, of course, China, they have a big land. So, for example, like Sanchen, when the industrial park, they can copy our experience and they can use probably 100 times bigger than us. For example, our original site is only about one square, sorry, one, uh, uh, 100 kilometers. Yeah. But they are new, for example, Suzhou, they could be 100, 100 bigger than us. Yeah. So it's 10, 10 kilometers square. Yeah. So if a country who didn't have bigger land, how, can it, how, how could they survive? Isn't there other approach? For example, like if your economy is moving to somewhere you want to give more innovation and for example like like you you graduate from Stanford something Stanford area probably they, they build a park and that's not so big like we, we did in, in, in China or in, in Taiwan. So is there any kind of uh, precondition for that? And and of course I'm I'm, I'm also an uh, economic uh, background. I firmly believe that should be the um, economy of scale is, is important. But somewhere when you move on to certain stage, probably we need to reshape our, our ideas. Probably not so big, but you in a medium or even small is beautiful, just like Singapore, for example. Thank you. So the, the, the first point is that it's very important to be realistic about the human capital of the population you're working with. If you're starting with people who have low levels of formal education and uh, who have little experience on the job, a job is the best way to accumulate skill. And so it's not a good strategy to think of people like that. Well, let's give them PhDs and then they can work in a research park that we'll build. That's not how the Asian miracle played out. The Asian miracle played out over and over again by making sure that everyone had a job to begin with, and then people accumulated skills on the job. So the challenge facing a, a place like uh, Sweden with very high levels of education per person is just a very different challenge from the challenge facing uh, Latin America, which still has very low levels of education per capita, especially if you correct for the actual test performance rather than years of, years of schooling. Uh, the, the second point is that I think people underestimate the importance of hub airports right now. There were technology centers in Syracuse, New York, where Corning invented fiber optics, or Rochester, New York, where Kodak invented photography, and Xerox invented 
uh, the Xerox machine. Rochester, New York, and Syracuse, New York are dying cities. PhDs won't go live there because it's too far from the hubs that connect you with the rest of the world. The corporate offices have left those places, and the research uh, activity, I predict, will not persist there. It'll go to a place like Boulder, where you've got a quick shot down the highway to the airport in Denver, or it'll go to New York City, or it'll go to Silicon Valley, where you can get to SFO and get a direct flight to anywhere you want to go. So it's just a sad reality. My first job was in Rochester, New York. There's a conference called the Carnegie Rochester Conference between Carnegie Mellon in, from Pittsburgh and Rochester, New York. That Conference of Economists now meets in New York City. So um, it's going to be hard to survive if you're not a hub airport in this high technology, high human capital competitive world. Um, here. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yeah, question. Um, how, in this case, how does the business plan work in the case of Honduras uh, with the private sector? Because yes. first of all, you have to develop all the infrastructure. Yeah. And then my question goes around, how would the real estate business work yeah. if the, well, I want to understand more because the land uh, is from the government or Yep. So basically, just yep. a little bit of information. Thank you. So uh, the model here will be like the model in Singapore, where the government started out owning the land and then leased the land to the private sector on long-term leases. So the private sector owns the buildings, but the government captures the lease revenue on the land. So that's the general structure in, in this zone. And the, that lease revenue can become a key source of the revenue for the government for paying for things like education, uh, health, basic public health, uh, policing. So, uh, so the private sector then can also build things like the port or the airport in return for being able to collect the fees uh, for unloading the containers or the passenger fees at the airport. So you can have private development of, of infrastructure private development of structures and of large, uh, large developments. But there will still be market lease payments, lease payments at the market rate for the value of the underlying land. Yeah, but I was, I was more into the service sector. For example, the, you're going to have a, a drain system, sewer systems, uh, mm -hmm. uh, water treatment plants, uh, energy, I mean, everything is going to manage, be managed by concessions by, for the private sector, or are there going to be uh, government-owned uh, companies? I, I, think, I think that uh, it, may, it may end up being a mixture of some state-owned companies, but I think to a large extent, you'd be better off dealing with uh, competitive bidding amongst private, uh, private operators. There's lots of companies around the world now that operate airports, operate ports, other companies that tend, that tend to build them. Companies can build out your electric grid. Companies can build even the, the water systems uh, and charge fees for them. It will take a regulatory system that both, and a legal system which protects the long-term investments of the firms, and also makes sure that they stick to the initial commitments they make in the competitive phase about, say, the rates they're gonna charge for electricity or water. But with the right legal structure, there's no reason why you can't have active private sector participation in all of those utility-like services. So perhaps one, one, more, one more maybe? Or, no? Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll make this the last question. So it has to be good. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon. I really like your presentation. And more than your presentation, I really like your concept okay. uh, of this uh, charter city. So you said that the progress depends on um, technology and rules. Yeah. And I believe, because your presentation goes to that direction, is the rules are the most important thing here. Okay. So what happened, what, uh, the question is, who should um, set up the rules in this, uh, in this uh, charter city. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned also that in France they have some issues with 
people doing P and everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. in this case, who should do uh, set up the, the, the rules, yeah. basically? Yeah. Well, one, one point that is worth pausing about is to ask, well, if the Hondurans have a consensus about changing the Constitution and changing the laws to create this new zone, you might say, well, why don't they just change the laws in all of Honduras? Why create the new zone? But here, I think the story of, of Dayton Hudson and Target is the one that applies. It's very hard to change not just the laws, but all of the norms about what everybody does in an existing organization. And so the most effective way for the leaders of the government in Honduras to change the rules may be to create a startup with new rules. So that answers the question fundamentally of what those new rules will be, which is that they're the rules created at the direction of the political leadership in Honduras. They ultimately have to be the ones who want this to, to take place. But the difference is, is that they can try rules in this new place that might be very controversial in the rest of Honduras. But if nobody lives there, you can say, here's a new rule that will apply there. And then if you want to opt in and live under that rule, that's fine. If you think that rule is objectionable, you're not compelled to, to go there. And so it gives them the chance to try some new kinds of rules that might be very important, although they're quite unfamiliar. And then those rules might spread to the rest of um, the rest of the country. One more question. Okay. One more. Um, uh, thank you very much. And kind of piggyback, uh, piggybacking off of that question. Um, is the que my question is basically on citizenship and borders. Uh -huh. um, I think one of the pictures that you might consider adding to, to your presentation is the fact that you see not just 15-year-old ch children um, risking their lives on a train, but also pregnant women uh, walking across deserts because our states have failed them so miserably. So if we have created conditions where pregnant women are willing to risk their lives and their children just to get citizenship from the United States, um, how will you be able to provide that, uh, that opportunity for people within the city? Are, are the Hondurans of this charter city going to be different from the Hondurans from the rest of the country? So remember, most people who move to the United States don't get citizenship. Many of them go there just for the opportunity to work in a factory and uh, have a job. So this new zone in Honduras could offer jobs for anyone who wants to move there. One of the changes in the law in this new zone specifies that this zone will be completely open to immigration from anywhere in the world. So people can move into the zone, live there as permanent residents, enjoy the protections of equal treatment under the law. So this is not like Dubai, where the migrants who move there are second or third class citizens. Everyone has got the same legal protections as a resident. The zone government cannot give Honduran citizenship. People will retain their own citizenship, but they'll have residency rights, permanent residency rights in, in, this, in the zone. And by, by this mechanism, part of what this could do, if this happens, and then Guatemala comes up with even better rules, starts another city that competes, and this spreads, then there could be many places that people like that pregnant woman or that 17-year-old kid, many places they could think about going, and they wouldn't have to risk their lives to get there, and they could live under the law with the protections of the law when they get there. Thank you.